What do you think of this word U-turn, this theme this year? I really like it. I find that it is the way, the art of making knowledge. We don't just go linear A to B to C, but we often are forced to U-turn. We have to ask ourselves, challenge our assumptions, look at the foregone conclusions before we move forward. And often, we'll move forward in an entirely new direction. War, rape, sexual assault. They're not things we usually like to talk about. Assault by rape is one of the most intimate of assaults. It transgresses psychological and physical boundaries. It goes into the sacred spaces of the body, and it always leaves scars. Some are physical, some, some are mental, but there is always scars. The commandeering of another person's body against their will is actually a form of torture, which hasn't always been recognized as such. Rape is not about sex. It's about power. It's about domination and subordination enacted through the sexual act. So why do I want to study war rape? Well, I was a nurse for many years in trauma settings in the hospital before I took a job as a sexual violence nurse in a clinic. At that time, it was so difficult to bring sources, resources around this traumatized individual. She didn't want to have her character questioned. She was afraid she would have to relive the trauma. And that's in a high resource setting like Canada in a relatively uh, safe country. So I was studying peace and conflict at the time when I learned just how many women were raped in war. 20,000 to 50,000 in the former Yugoslavian crisis. Now, I know statistics can be a little bit messy and unclear, but these are usually underestimations because of the fear and pain of stigmatization of coming forward after being sexually violated. If these women were primary caretakers, looking after elderly, sick, and children, that damage is exponential. The historic impun impunity has not helped either. In fact, in my lifetime, less than 30 years ago, we had our first convictions for war rape. That's pretty astounding. I mean, war rape used to be considered just an unfortunate side effect of war. So what are the other theories around war rape? Well, there's the idea that uh, there's a general disdain for women the world over, that they occupy a lower status. When war ensues, as Clausewitz, a war theorist, once said, war is politics by other means. So if you have a low status in times of peace, in times of conflict, your status will drop even lower. There's also this idea that the woman's body is property of the nation state or the social group. She gives birth to future generations. She's kind of like the cultural glue that holds the social group together. So it stands to reason that if you want to destroy a social group, you aim for the soft center, you aim for the women. You know, ethnic cleansing is one of these examples. There's also the idea that men's honor is mirrored in the chastity and purity of his associated women. So in this sort of construct, the enemy can do a lot more damage to his opponent by violating his women, his women, I put in quotes, and by extension, shaming and emasculating him. So after reading all these theories, I really wanted to know more. And as luck would have it, some colleagues of mine introduced me to the Democratic Republic of Congo, 
which several years ago was actually touted as the rape capital of the world. Yeah, I just wanted to mention too that men and boys are also affected, but I'll be talking about women today, and they suffer consequences in their own unique way. What I'd like to do now is situate our talk and take you to Congo via the map. So I was situated in Bukavu, which is the eastern border of Congo, very resource-rich area. This country in the heart of Africa is as big as Western Europe. It's a huge country. 66 million people inhabit here, and 50% of them are under the age of 15, which is a hugely critical dynamic demographic when you consider child soldier usage. The supply is endless. They have suffered decades of brutal colonialism, 30 years of Mobutu, a self-indulgent dictator that did not honor his citizens. And us from functioning nation states kind of take for granted the value we have as citizens. In this resource rich area, it's the epicenter of the conflict. Has anyone here ever been to Congo? Does anyone have one of these, a mobile phone? You actually might be closer to Congo than you think. Congo is blessed, or should we say cursed, with natural resources, the three Ts, tin, tungsten, and tantalum. And the tantalum that comes from Colton, DRC provides 80% of the world's Colton. And it is in all our technological devices. So child soldiers go into makeshift mines, risking their lives for less than a dollar a day, digging out these precious metals to bring them to our markets. But this war isn't just about minerals. If we look at the borders of Congo, they're not borders decided on by the local people. They were decided in the late 1800s by colonial powers without any attention to the local needs, and they've been endlessly problematic. This war has also been called a war on women because of the extreme sexual violence. In fact, they coined a new label called extreme sexual violence to because women's vaginas are impaled with sticks, gun butts, and glass shards as well as penile penetration. So when I went to Congo, the first people that I interviewed was local leaders. They came from NGOs, churches, and local government, and they were extremely excited that I could come and talk to them, that some was interested in their opinion. But then they got into the nitty-gritty details. They said, we're astounded at how much attention sexual violence is receiving in this war that's been going on for 20 years, almost 20 years, and has claimed 5.4 million lives. They said there were so many things else happening in this country that actually drive war rape. The grinding poverty, in fact, civilians are sometimes raping now to provide for their daily needs in this atmosphere of impunity. The fact that ra raped women are rejected from their community, the fact that it's mass traumatization, not just traumatization of the directly affected. These men who have had to witness their wives being raped or hearing these stories daily or things happening to daughters, sons, etc. It, it ends up in mass traumatization. But there's not a lot of attention paid to that. They actually complained of international apathy. They said there's so many other conflicts in the world that get so much more attention than what is happening here. 
They complained also that aid was very often inappropriate. Why do we keep delivering food to this country, which is fertile and rich in natural resources and could easily look after itself? They would prefer to have roads, peace, and rebuilding of infrastructure. They talked about how the Christian church was fantastic in that it was the only functioning infrastructure and that it actually delivered a lot of support and health services to the people. The problem is it also had a dark side. Sometimes when raped women were rejected from their communities, the churches played a role. Sometimes the interpretation of their doctrine promoted the dominance of men and the subordination of women. And many times, church leaders distanced themselves from matters of sexuality and sex, which is a very important thing to talk about when this sort of violence is taking place. So, with all that in mind, I'd like to take you to Congo and meet some of the people that I met there. I don't usually like to talk about this, but I'm going to tell you because I want you to tell everybody what is happening to us here. I was on my way to the field one day, as usual, where I cultivate, get food for the family, when I was met by five soldiers. They wanted my money and my cell phone. I gave them everything, but they still raped me. After the third one, I don't even remember what happened. I can't even remember. So I went home, and my husband said, where were you? And he found out what happened, and he said, why were you even there? You shouldn't have been there. He just doesn't understand. He thinks it's my fault. He blames me. He said, get out of here, you wife of the rebels. So he kept our children, and I walked and walked. Anyways, I'm here now at the hospital, and all I have is her. I want to live for her. But it's been tough, because sometimes when I look in her face, I see the, the perpetrators, and I relive the whole story. I get so filled with fear and rage. But the hospital has been so helpful. They tell me she's a gift from God, and she is a gift from God. It's not her fault. It's just that now we're both HIV positive, and I just don't know where I'm going to go. I just don't know what I'm going to do once the hospital tells me to leave. Yeah? So what do you want to know? No, nobody wants to go to war, but what choices do we have? I mean, I was trying to go to school when I was kidnapped, taken on the way to school. I prayed that I didn't get taken. I knew other boys that were. I said, this is not the life I want for me. But I know some guys did join because you got a pair of pants. I mean, they thought that was cool. They thought the uniform looked so nice. I used to pray with my eyes open, because if you close your eyes, they beat you, that someday I would get out of this. Oh, my stomach hurts. No, I didn't violate anyone. I didn't rape anyone. But I know why they do. Well, no, I didn't. I didn't do anything. Because look at me, I'm a child. They said, you're too small. You don't have to do it. So I was lucky. But I know why they do it. Because when you're humiliated by your group and you have nowhere to turn, all you want to do is hurt other people. All you want to do is destroy. Do you not understand that? We're supposed to kill or be killed. Sometimes the Muganga would put herbs under our skin. It was kind of uncomfortable at the time, but actually it worked. 
He said, now you can go out to the front of the battlefield and bullets will go right through you and nothing will happen. And you know, it worked. Look at me, I'm still here today. And it gave me a chance to use the gun. The gun, I, I really fell in love with the gun because the gun was so powerful. It became my mother, it became my father. It would get me anything I needed. But that, that was then. I don't want to go back to war, no, not really, but what are the choices now? I have no family. Let me ask you a question for a change. Do you have any kids? Two? I bet they live really well. So let's head back to Uppsala. As you can see, local leaders showed a very profound understanding of this complex situation around the phenomena of war rape. Affected women suffered unimaginable losses of bodily integrity, health, status, children, space and place in which to move. Young boy soldiers living in impoverished conditions, in insecurity all the time, are forced into this militarized masculinity in order to survive. So these are the faces we don't always see when we see any sort of media representations or academic analyses. So what are we left with now? Is there anything we can do or is it just apathy? I, like Margaret Mead, would like to think that a thoughtful and concerned group of people can change the world because if we look back in history, that's frankly all that ever happened. So I challenge you to look at the structures and institutions and activities to see if there are any remnants of this historical impunity that didn't understand rape as assault still functioning today. On a more practical level, we belong to the biggest group, most influential group in this conflict, consumers. So, just as we've moved towards fair trade buying habits, I think we can also move towards conflict-free minerals and demanding that. So the next time that you are preparing to purchase a technological device, ask questions, be critical. Now, it's your turn. Thank you very much.